you're worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I had a mass of the Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Ay, 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 ay. I was born May 23rd, 1979. I believe I was possibly the product of a blizzard that came through the following year. During that blizzard, a lot of family, a lot of children were born in Indianapolis. It was known as the blizzard of 1978. My father and my mother were never married. They stayed together. I would say until around the age of three or four years of age, it was not just myself, but I was a second child. My sister was the oldest. Mother and my father had her their senior year in high school. And I came along about five years later. And my memory of the years before the age of four Memories that are not what I would call good memories, but I would say memories that were birthed out of tragic situations or adversity. I remember I was two years old, was riding around in the front, in the front and that's back in the day when they used to have those little yellow Tonka trucks. These kids don't know nothing about them Tonka trucks a day. It was when Tonka trucks, when toy trucks were built for tough. <laughs> they, they did not break. And uh, you would put your knee into the Tonka truck, any early, <laughs> 
late 70s, early kids, 80 kids know what I'm talking about. You put your knee in the Tonka truck and you kick with the one leg and you thrust it and you would go flying. Well, I remember one night, one morning, or one afternoon, I was on the Tonka truck and I don't know if I hit a rock or something, but I went flying with my head face first into the pavement and knocked my two front teeth out. Went to the doctor, went to the hospital, and uh, the doctor put my teeth back in my mouth and told me, you know, not to, I can't remember what it did, but he told me not to do something. And uh, I, my sister had given me a now later. That was a favorite candy of mine. And uh, I came into the bedroom with my teeth stuck in the now later. <laughs> and my mother said, I ain't taking you back to the hospital no more. She said, just, just leave it. You're just going to be teethless, you know. <laughs> snag a tooth. Snag a couple of teeth. Snag a teeth. <laughs> For the next several years. The home that I lived in was very hostile. I remember arguments. I remember my mother, um, I remember around the age of four, right before she moved. I remember her getting into an argument with my father and I remember taking a, a Coca-Cola glass. That was back when you would go to McDonald's and uh, they would give you, you know, glasses that were worthy of keeping. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was before people used to get the cups. Yep. And you'd go home and we would have Burger King cups, Donald, Dairy Queen cups, we had McDonald's cups, and they were real cups, but they, they had these glasses that they would pass out. I think it was probably around the Christmas time of every year. And um, I remember her getting into an argument with my father, and I remember her slamming the glass on the ground. It was not long after that that my mother and my father split up. And then I remember us making another move. I remember me and my sister moving and staying with my grandmother and my grandfather for about a year or so. And my father ended up getting married and I remember moving in with him and my stepmother and my sister. And I would say by the time it was over with and done, um, I remember about seven years old, I began to tell my mother, my mother was always in and out of the picture. And I remember telling my mother, I said, I'm being abused at home. And uh, my father was one that before he passed away, he was always apologizing to us for the way that he did us when we were younger. He told me, he said, George, not long before he died, he said, George, he said, one of the challenges that I dealt with was that I I, I, I grew up so soon, and he said I had two children at a very young age. And he said I was angry and I was bitter. And he said that there were times where I would come home and I would take it out on the family. And I remember um, around that time, I remember around a particular time, around the age of seven years old, um, I think I had just cut school for the first time. Yeah, second grade. And uh, yeah, second grade, it was problematic. <laughs> it was not long after I cut school for the first time um, in the second grade that, um, and that was before, you know, they had cell phones and everybody didn't have a house phone, so you can get away with stuff. And um, unless your parents had intuition, <laughs> or did, you know, unless you were Pentecostal, your parents had discernment. <laughs> but nevertheless, I remember, I remember my stepmother, my mother coming and picking us up and I remember telling her, informing her of some abuse that was taking place with me physically at the house and I began to show her some of the scars and began to show her all the wounds and scars that were on my body. And she decided that at that moment she was 
uh, going to come, and I think it was about a week later, um, she um, came, and next thing you know, she's picking us up, and all of a sudden, we're leaving, and we're, we're now moving uh, away from the house. And my sister and her never really had what we would call a good, healthy relationship, so it didn't really last long at all. I remember my sister going back and staying with my parents, my father, my stepmother, um, and I remember staying with my uh, biological mother for about, I would say about a year, or maybe six months, I'd say, to a year. And during this time period, it was like I was trying to get out of one bad situation, stepped into a worse situation. And I ended up being molested during that time period by a living boyfriend of hers. And I remember during this season of my life, I remember having a dream, one of the first dreams I'd ever had from God. And, uh, and during this time where um, my innocence was being stolen from me, I remember having a dream. And, um, and one night I had this dream and there was a, uh, a man that came to visit me in the room. He came to the house and uh, he picked me up and, uh, in, the, in the dream. And uh, in the dream, uh, he tells my mother, he says, I'm going to take your son for a little while and I'm going to bring him back. And next thing you know, I remember us flying into the sky. And uh, he took me to a house in, in the sky. And uh, it was a house that had no doors. It only had a window. And I remember him putting me, taking me through this window. And I remember being held in that room. Uh, almost like as a place of safety or something. Um, at that time, you got to think a little seven-year-old really um, has a hard time trying to figure out what was going on. But um, thank you, Lord. Uh, but 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 when I sit back and I think about you know hindsight, I could see that God was trying to do something with my mind, and that God was trying to bring me peace in the midst of chaos, in the midst of great destruction. I believe that there was something major and spiritual that was taking place in that room and uh, or in that dream. And I remember going back. Um, I remember being in the sky and uh, said that he would bring me back next weekend or something. I mean, at the end of the week, something. And I remember waking up later. And uh, when I woke up, I remember feeling like, you know, things are just going to be all right. I remember after this season of my life, I remember moving back to my father's house and um, you know, moving with my, st with my grandparents. And then from my grandparents, uh, my mother just kind of disappeared again and uh, moved back in with my father. And my father began to, we started, you know, things were going a little better. I wasn't getting beat like I was before. But then there came a time when my father started getting angry and upset again, and it was then that I began to express to him, um, no, he began to say, I'm going to send you back to your mother. And I said, I began to beg him. I said, but Dad, please don't send me back. I began to beg him not to send me back. And all of a sudden, I think he began to think, like, you know, why is it that George is uh, so adamant about, at one time he was so adamant about, seeing his mother, but now he's begging me to not go back to his mother's house. He said one day, he said, George, on the way of picking my sister up from one of my aunt and uncle's houses, I remember coming off 465 on 86th Street, 86 in Keystone in Indianapolis, Indiana. I remember coming off the interstate and my father spoke to me. He said, George, he said, uh, why is it that you don't want to go back? And I told him, I said, I said, Dad, I said, uh, my mom's boyfriend's been touching on me. And I began to express to him the details of things that were going on. Well, immediately, uh, my father was able to keep it together. But I remember us going to the police precinct and uh, remember filing the report. I remember speaking to, uh, the, t speaking to the detective uh, concerning the things that were transpiring in the house and what took place in the house. And um, I remember feeling like, you know, um, 
not necessarily knowing or totally understanding the totality of what was transpired or what had transpired, uh, but I knew um, that something terrible had happened. But I remember as I began to go home with my father, I felt like everything was just going to be all right. But it was not long after that, I would say about a year later, uh, that my father began to beat me even more. And once again, like I said, I was not what you would call the golden child. I was probably more along the lines of the black sheep of the family. I was more along the lines of a child that uh, had a lot of problems. But I would tell you that probably um, if I would have been raised differently or if I would have been in a home uh, that, 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 that probably would have had uh, some of the things that some of you people in this room have been privileged to have. I believe that I probably would have made a lot more better decisions, I believe, to some degree, uh, not all. I believe that to some degree, though, that there are some decisions that probably would have been made differently if I would have been raised in a better environment. But nevertheless, God was faithful. And I remember, I remember uh, it was within a matter of, you know, a year, and next thing you know, uh, my father not only was beating me real bad, but it was also beginning to sexually abuse my sister. And uh, this abuse carried on until it was time for us both to leave the house. And uh, I remember after all of this, all this stuff transpired, I remember being about 18 years old, and I remember my senior year in high school, and uh, I remember getting into a situation with the police. I was always uh, in a lot of trouble. I was in the gangs. I was very angry. I was very, very bitter. Um, I had a lot of rage on the inside of me, but a lot of the rage that was on the inside of me was due to me holding secrets that were going on in the house and things that had transpired with myself. And I was talking to the pastor the other day, or another pastor somewhere else, and I said, usually whenever you find perversion, you'll always find anger somewhere. Whenever you see an angry spirit, you always find perversion connected somewhere to it. Because oftentimes people will take the anger to try to cover up the hurt and try to cover up the pain that is, you know, going on in their life. But I remember, you know, like I said, being in gangs, getting in trouble and all that stuff. And uh, things began to go from worse, someone say from worse to worser. And uh, things began to get a lot worse in my life. And I decided what I was going to do my senior year of high school. I was going to, um, I ran away from home. And uh, when I ran away from home, um, I ended up deciding to uh, commit a few crimes. And this was during the time period that I was supposed to uh, use the military. I was going to go to the Army. I went through the delayed entry program, and I was waiting to be uh, sent off to basic training for, um, you know, their, the, they had a little program that they had for uh, high school students. And uh, what ended up occurring was um, I ended up getting into trouble. I stole a recruiting station's car. And... Uh, yeah, I had a lot of problems. Stole the car, the car from the recruiting station and had some other crimes that, you know, I was tied to that it looked like I was going to be able to beat and, and some other cases that it looked like I was going to end up, you know, uh, getting a slap on the wrist for. And uh, I remember during this time, spirit, time span that it was like all of a sudden my whole life crashed. And I remember uh, a certain situation that occurred where one night I was um, actually getting ready to get killed. And a uh, matter of fact, I was always in the something where it seemed like death was always in the picture. However, God was faithful. God would always block it. God would always uh, make things happen. And uh, I remember one night deciding that I was enough was enough and uh, I needed help because I had become so depressed. Depression was so strong within my spirit that I remember staying under a bed for about a couple of days. I could not move. I could not eat. I, I just stayed under a bed because depression had just gripped my spirit in such a way that I, I, I really just didn't want to live. And then all of a sudden, I remember 
uh, that my girlfriend at the time, uh, she was a backslider, but I knew that there was something different about her church and not only different about the church that she attended, but there was something different about her mom. And um, I, I knew that they had something that I didn't have and I needed whatever I could get in order to move to the next place because I knew that I was going to die. I knew that either I was going to take my life or I knew that someone else was going to take my life. So I remember asking her, Brother Milton, I said, um, I said, can you talk to me about this baptism in the name of Jesus? Can you, did you, did you were talking to me about it? She took me to the book of Acts, and then she said, well, you know, I said, well, whatever I got to do, I said, I need it, I want it. And I went, and I got baptized that night. God filled me with the Holy Ghost about three or four nights later. And after that occurred, it was like all of a sudden, um, you know, like I said, I was already moved out of the house. And, um, you know, I was staying with a friend uh, that she was, a, she, was a, she was an older woman. You know, she was not older, but she was older than me. And uh, she basically, uh, when she knew that I ran away, we worked together at the grocery store. She knew when I ran away, she just wanted me to graduate. So she was like, you know, I'm going to open up my house to you. You can stay with me. She said, you don't have to pay anything. Just graduate, you know, and go to the military. And uh, so what ends up happening, nevertheless, I end up getting into, I got the Holy Ghost and uh, I had all this trouble that was, you know, in front of me. And next thing you know, the police are now looking for me. They're tying me to all kind of crimes. So when that happens, I decide, well, I'm not going to school. Praise God. So I decided I was going to drop out of high school my second semester, senior year, uh, because I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to go to jail. So I was on the run. And um, I started getting into because I went on the run, I, I got into more trouble. Why? Because it's like, well, if I'm on the run, I can't, can't hold a job. If I'm on the run, I can't, you know, hold a job. And I, you can't be on the run and be living for God. You can't be on the run, praise the Lord, and be saved. So I'm like, well, you know, if I'm going to be on the run, I'm going to just get it how I live. And um, I'm just going to um, live a life of a, cr a criminal. I'm not going to live a sanctified life. Praise the Lord if I'm on the run, but I'm going to just, you know, if, if I'm going to be out here, I'm going to be out here doing good. I ain't going to be out here doing bad. So I never uh, understood a broke hustler. Uh, I never understood committing felonies and you ain't really getting paid for it. Uh, I didn't understand, praise the Lord, you being somebody that's out here selling dope and, and, and you need to borrow $50. Just, you know, that just wasn't my M.O., so, you know, that mentality that I had turned around and I ended up getting into a lot of trouble. And like I told you before, by the time I knew it, I was facing 106 years in prison. I was a four-time convicted felon and I was sentenced to 14 years in the state prison where I did six and a half years in the state prison in Indiana straight. That's not including the other cases and things that I got dismissed along the way. And now since all of that, about three years ago, they ended up, uh, the governor of Indiana, after like, I would say after about 20 years, uh, the governor of Indiana, uh, uh, the judge, uh, decided that what they were going to do is they were going to uh, expunge my whole criminal record. So everything got erased. Uh, if you tried to look me up, you wouldn't find nothing but some tickets. Amen. They even gave me a concealed and open carry, uh, a, a gun permit, praise God. Yeah, so like if I wanted to go out for the police department, I could do that. That's how clean I am. You know, it was like being born again. But it was not long. I remember when God turned around and um, I came home from prison. I didn't think I was going to really make it out. At first when I went in, I just knew that I was going to, I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. I just, I just knew that I would kill somebody. Uh, I had anger problems. I still, I had issues that were on the inside of me, and I, 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 I just had zero tolerance. I just had this bitterness, this anger that, 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 that carried me from, from a child. And uh, I never learned how to deal with my problems. I learned how to run from them. 
and then what would happen is if I someone did something to me, I'd harness it, and then next thing you know, I would harness everything, and then next thing you know, uh, somebody would do something. Next thing you know, you you'd have that you know psychotic moment where you just snap. Anybody ever snap before? I guess I'm the only one. Praise the Lord. Some of your children in here will tell you, man, mom's tripping. Don't go upstairs. <laughs> You know, dad, dad's tripping. Uh, I ain't, don't, don't go on upstairs. As a matter of fact, the other night, me and my wife was walking down this, was walking around the neighborhood, and uh, one of the kids, um, one of Isaac's friends, we walk around the neighborhood, and uh, one of Isaac's friends came outside and told his daughter, told his sister, he said, uh, mom, dad, he said, mom said, you got to come in the house at seven. And, uh, and, and, and she said, but mom said 7.30. He's like, yeah, mom said 7.30, but then dad got mad, and now he said 7 o'clock. So, you know, broadcasted around the whole neighborhood. <laughs> Praise the Lord, the dad's mad. He's, you know, the way he said it was like, pop's tripping, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, you know, he's like, man, you know, pop's tripping. So, um, you know, it, it was kind of like, one of these situations where I would snap and I would black out and whatever happened just happened. And what would happen was I was so concerned about me doing something. But during that time period in prison, I began to learn the voice of God, develop the relationship with God. And uh, I never killed anyone. I threatened to. Uh, but God was working with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Some folks in here are probably like, I'm happy he worked with you in there. <laughs> Not here, you know. But, you know, the Lord was working with me. And then next thing you know, uh, uh, each year the anger started getting low. And now I'm not wanting to kill people over petty stuff. It's now, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm now kind of relaxed. And, and trust me, please, I'm not going to kill nobody. I ain't going to, I'm not going to bust a grape in the fruit factory. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, I remember coming home or on my way home. And I knew I didn't deserve to be out. I, was just, I just knew that somebody was going to go and try to tie me to this crime, tie me to that crime tell on me for this, you know, you know, back in the day, snitches got stitches, but, you know, during the time period of, you know, being incarcerated, it was like snitches got promoted, so it was like, you know, I'm over here, I'm stressing over, rather not giving out too much information to people, and I'm trying to, I'm sitting back night after night, week after week, seeing if I was able to cover my tracks, and, and all that stuff with different things, and listen, some of y'all that are trying to figure stuff out is past the statute of limitation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I ain't going to ever be guilty of telling on myself. <laughs> Amen, somebody. So all you little snitches out there trying to get your little peewee and your little June bug to, buddy that's locked now. But no. <laughs> snitches, yeah, that's what I, you know. Confidential informant. <laughs> but nevertheless, I came home. And there was this part of me that, you know, I, it was hard for me to believe. I remember my mother, my biological mother picking me up. And I told her, I said, listen, I was like, when we, when, when, when I come through that gate, I said, uh, ain't, matter of fact, I said, you ain't even got to meet me at the door. I said, just had a car running. I said, because, like, I, 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 ain't, I, I don't want these people to accidentally, you know, say something like, hold on, Mr. Hurt, because they, they were known for that, you know. They wait till your release date, and you think you you to get out, and the your state police or the sheriff department to be sitting there next to your family, and they're like, uh, we want to read you this arrest warrant for a crime that you did back in 1992. So, like, I'm, I'm being tormented because I'm feeling like, you know, the possibility that things are going to, you know, I, I just knew that life was going to possibly collapse. I knew, 
uh, uh, that there was going to be an upset. I knew that uh, deep down inside that, that there was a possibility that, that, that something, you know, would be too good to be true and that basically I knew that things were going to eventually collapse. So I was tormented until God began to speak to me. He was like, George, I've got a purpose for this time. I've got a purpose for your life. I've got a plan for your life. He said, I don't want you living in torment of the past. I don't want you to feel like you've got to go and tell everybody your business, uh, things that you've done. He said, I've washed it under the blood. He said, I don't remember it no more. He said, neither should you remember it no more. I want you to remember what I spoke to you. I want you to remember the promises that I've given you because the promises I've given you are far greater than the things that you've come from. So just forget about it. Listen, somebody in this room needs to learn how to forget about some things. But nevertheless, I remember telling my mother, I said, listen, when, I, when it's time to go, I said, you know, like, we're we not going to hug in the foyer. <laughs> we can hug when we get home. <laughs> just, just, you know, hurry up and, you know. And I, I think she thought we was getting ready to have one of those, you know, Hollywood moments where you kind of come out and, and you just kind of hug each other. And like, no, I was like, let's go, let's go. You would have thought I was breaking out the prison. <laughs> And, uh, and due to the fact that one of my cases was a attempted escape from the jail. Um, yeah, we got stories for days. <laughs> you know, if they see me running anywhere close to near the door, you know, I can't run in the prison because some folks think I'm up to something. I came running out the door. They, they, that door began, there was a boom. <laughs> That thing, the gate starts pulling back, and I'm like, man, I'm not even waiting for the gate to open all the way. I'm squeezing through the gate. And I run through the door, and I was like, they was like, you know, the COs, the correctional officers, like, Mr. Hurt, you know, you, I see y'all later. I'm gone, you know. I'm like, you know, I've run out the door, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, like, tell my white mother to come on, hurry up, let's go, let's go. And, uh, you know, she had done got a new car. You know, since the time that, you know, I had gotten locked up. So I'm like, let's get to the car. Let's get to the car. But nevertheless, we ended up getting home. And I remember looking at the streets. I remember looking at life. And I remember thinking, like, I don't deserve to be here. I remember thinking about all the people that I knew that will never get out. I began to think about a good friend of mine that I knew that had 15 more years to go. And I began to think about another guy in there that had been down since the 70s that taught me how to kill somebody. And I began to think about how good God was. And there was a desire to to not only to never go back to prison, but there was a desire to make something out of my life. I don't know if there's anybody in this room that's ever lost time. You ever had a chunk or a season. Maybe you were in a relationship. Maybe you were uh, on drugs. Maybe you were on alcohol. Maybe you did not fully commit yourself. I don't know if you've ever known what it is like to have a huge season snatched from you. I tell you, even to this day, there are some memories, a lot of my conversations are geared towards a season that was snatched out. A lot of my experiences, my relationship with God came from prison. Some of the dreams that I have is never a week that goes by, never really a month that goes by. I have a dream about prison. Uh, you got to understand that when you have gone through a season, sometimes a season has a way of never leaving your mind. It is challenging for something to just kind of just kind of just leave. So you kind of learn how to grow with it. You try to learn how to adapt with it. You try to learn how to utilize it for your future. You try to make sure that the things of the past never work against you, but you try to use the things of the past to work for you. 
But the thing and the challenge is this, is that when you have had time that has been snatched, and now not only do you have time that's snatched, but the time that has been given has been given to you, and you know that it is not for you. You know that you have not earned this time. You know that, that you haven't done anything positive to gain this time, but everything you've done was actually, uh, that, that everything that you've done uh, should have snatched the time that's in front of you. I remember having this mentality that I was never, at this moment, I was not on my time clock, but now I'm on God's time clock. I remember not long after that, I turned around, I met my wife about a month later. I got out February, February 11th, and I met my, saw my wife for the first time March the 11th. We started talking on the phone about May 26th, uh, probably now about May 20, yeah, May 25th. And then uh, I made up in my mind that I was going to marry her probably about five minutes after I talked to her on the phone. <laughs> and after that happened, I was like, all right, I wanna, I, I, I remember people and I remember the pressure because when I walked past people in the church, I walked past people that knew me, they, they, they thought that maybe I, that, that, that they were almost waiting for the old man to come out. You know, I was a changed man. I was a new person in Christ. But because people weren't there with me through my process, they, they, were, they were waiting for God to fail than to see God succeed. See, I don't think there are many people in this room that, 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 that know what I'm talking about. When, it, when, 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 when you have been brought out, but people think you're going back in. When, 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 when people see God deliver you and they're expecting to see the malfunction, they're waiting to see a dysfunction, they're waiting to see a breakdown, their, their, their expectation is for you to walk away from God than it is for you to walk with God. I tell you, some of the opposition that I probably dealt with came more from people that had an expectation of me failing than devils that wanted me to fail. I remember going to people and they would be like, you know, folks would, you know, you go over to their house and they start putting stuff up. Be like, hold on. Who's out there? You, John, brother, John hurt? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They go on upstairs. Boom, 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 boom. Come on down. Just stay right here. Stay right here. They go back upstairs and make sure everything's put away. Like you're going to rob them. I believe that there are more people that we would see stick if we'd have confidence in God's restoration power. I believe that there would be more people that we would see stick if we had confidence in God's salvation power. If we truly believe the scripture, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are made new. When the environment around you is convinced that old things still live, then nothing is made new. See, the thing is, is that I believe that God put me by myself to put me in a safe environment, and I found that God was more patient with me than people. Why? Because the thing is, there's a process. And, 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 and for someone in this room, and this is not so much the message, but some of you that are in this room that are wrestling with the process, maybe the process isn't happening the way that you want it or is not moving at the pace that you want it, stay the course. Stay the course because God knows the way that you take. God knows how to deliver you. God knows how to heal you. God knows how to sustain you. God knows how to give you the breakthrough and the deliverance that you need. But you've got to stay. you got to stay the course. So what ends up transpiring was that I, wanted, I had this desire. I wanted to... It felt like I was walking around. It felt like I had to please people. I had to prove myself. 
And have you ever been in a place where you felt like you had to always prove yourself? You had to actually go overboard to let people know that this is not your motive. This is not your intention. That you're not trying to do this, but you're trying to do that. You're, you're not at liberty to just kind of just walk the way that you want to walk. But you got to always give a disclaimer that this is not my motive. This is not my intent. This is not what I plan to do. Why? Because when people that are around you are more convinced and the enemy having a hold of you, then God having a hold of you is kind of hard to continue to walk when you've got a, uh, you, you, it's kind of hard to continue to walk when the environment, the culture that is around you makes you feel like you've got to prove yourself than it is when there's an expectation. Can I tell you, church, there are people that God wants to bring to this church but do they have to prove themselves or do you have an expectation that God's going to keep them? Do you have an expectation that God's going to deliver them? Do you have an expectation God's going to break the chains of, off their life? Because can I tell you that, that some of the leaders and some of the men and women of God that you have here in this church, they had baggage before they came here. They, 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 they came out of stuff. They went through things. When they came in here, they didn't come in here preaching. No, they, they, they didn't come in here preaching. They didn't come here teaching Bible studies. Praise the Lord. They didn't come in here shouting and dancing. They came in here high. They came in here drunk. They came in here on marijuana. They came in here with needles in their arm. And they came in here with anger problems. Some came in here racist. Some came in here bitter. Some came in here. But the thing was, people had confidence in the power of the Holy Ghost. They didn't judge you based upon where you came from. They did not categorize you based upon your background. Listen, they didn't want to know my rest. They, 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 they don't, they, you know, uh, these people didn't come in and require a resume. What side of town do you come from? What type of job do you have? What type of background do you have? What kind of family do you have? What type of morals do you have? Why? Because the reason why uh, 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 some of us are able to build such churches is because, not because the people are actually changing, but because they come from a good, healthy moral culture or a good, healthy family. So what's happening is not that the Holy Ghost is actually changing the people that are coming and sitting on some of these pews. It's just that they have adapted to the religious traditional spirit, praise the Lord, that filters to the church that doesn't really require a Holy Ghost change. You can still stay bitter, praise the Lord, and sing on the praise team. Praise God, you can have a gossiping spirit, and you can still get behind the pulpit and preach. Praise the Lord. See, these people, you don't have to teach them how to stop selling drugs. Why? Can I tell you, can I ask you how many people that you have baptized in this church over the past five to ten years, praise the Lord, that were on drugs that are still here? How many people in this church that you have baptized and prayed through that were drug dealers that are still here? The thing is, is that we are used to, we're moving into a culture where we're only sustaining people that come in that are already morally right, but spiritually wrong. Can I tell you, church, that this Holy Ghost power has the power to deliver not only those that are morally wrong, but those that are spiritually wrong. This Holy Ghost power, praise the Lord, doesn't need something to work with in order to fully deliver and break the chains off of somebody. But if we kind of come in and we're like, well, man, I, I don't like his background. Or, man, uh, I don't like where he comes from. Man, uh, you know, he, he just kind of make me nervous. Listen, when you would have met me when I first got the Holy Ghost, I looked like I was going to rob you. Come to the church. Preacher be like, praise the Lord, what's up? Pass around the offering plate. You know, they, they put down, you know. Sing an offering song. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, if folks be going around, out, you know, like I, I, I walk around the offering plate because I'm not fully, I'm still coming out. Somebody sing Jesus, I'll never forget. Jesus, I'll never forget. 
five, ten, twenty-five, hundred, thirty. 30. <laughs> You don't just walk past money, you count it. You know, if, if you can't grab it, you count it. You want to know where, how much is there. <laughs> Deacon sizing you up, you know. Usher sizing you up. Like, you know, he don't be putting nothing in, but he be looking at, you know. <laughs> like, if you ain't got nothing, touch the basket. Jesus, I never you can almost hold on to the basket, like looking in there. I didn't got all them envelopes in there. Uncover it. <laughs> but nevertheless, it takes word to bring about the transformation. See, somewhere along the line, I remember baptizing someone and someone got the Holy Ghost. And the person, the, the, there was a deacon in the church that was like, you know, Brother Hurd, I don't know if he really, really got the Holy Ghost. I, you know, when I got the Holy Ghost, praise God, it brought me all the way out. I don't know about these folks today and they Holy Ghost, they get the day because, you know, when we came out, we came out, we didn't act like that. When you got the Holy Ghost, you don't talk. It changed the way you walk. It changed the way you talk. It changed... Well, if it did all that, why are you still acting like that? It takes the word to begin to wash you. After you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, the, 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 the blood washes away your sins. But the word, it washes away your old character. Praise the Lord. It puts in you a new mindset. It washes your mind. It washes your thoughts to the place where you start thinking different. You start talking different. You start walking different. Why? Because the Bible says, whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what happened was that people come to church and the people are getting baptized in churches where they're set up to fail. The, the, the environment, praise the Lord, is set up for destruction. And now what is happening is like, man, you know, there are times where I go to places, praise the Lord, and you get somebody that God's really done something on the inside of that individual and then what happens is you get that couple that comes in praise the Lord one of them got long hair and the other one stands about six foot tall praise the Lord and they got several kids and they just look like a good nice healthy family that are just kind of fit in real good with your church and just fit in real good praise the Lord with the congregation it'll fit in real good with the youth group praise the Lord and what will happen is people will flock to that person but reject this person right here that may be the Apostle Paul listen if you want to have Apostle Paul's come out of your church you got to be you can't run away when they come in as Saul's what do you mean most apostle Pauls don't come in preaching. They come in killing. They got blood on their hands. They got death on their hands. They don't come in as Saul's. They come in. They don't come in as Paul's. They come in as Saul's. But if you're not afraid of Saul, you will see a Paul. If you're not afraid to go to Saul, you will see a Paul. I thank the Lord for the man that was not intimidated by going to where Saul is. Come on, we want to go to where the bankers are. We want to go to where the lawyers are. I'm sick and tired of going to conferences uh, where preachers get up and say, I got millionaires in my church and I got this in my church. Listen, all they do is give their money. Uh, bring me some drug dealers. Give me some crack addicts. Uh, give me some bang gang bangers. Uh, why? Because a millionaire will try to send their money around the world. Uh, but I need somebody that will go and preach this thing uh, around the world. Uh, can I tell Tell somebody in this room this afternoon uh, that God is looking for somebody that will quit being intimidated. Don't measure the future by the past. The glory, if the glory of the latter house is, will be greater than that of the former, praise the Lord, why would you measure what God's potential is for somebody's life? 
based upon the baggage that they come out of. Do you understand that if any man be in Christ, uh, he's a new creature? Don't you understand that the glory of the Lord uh, is on the line right now? Uh, and that if you would just step back uh, and watch God move, uh, God will probably get more glory out of God sending and directing and changing uh, that man than somebody that came in uh, and they say, you know what? What are you saying, Brother Hurt? Talking about people. They're trying to build God's kingdom. See, the Bible says, the Lord added to the church daily. You know, I believe that God, people are like, why is it that people aren't added to the church daily? Because the church is selecting who, who God, they're selecting, they're going through, and they said, that'll be a good one. That'll be, no, no, no. Let me get this one. Let me take that. I'll take one of them. Uh, let me get, that. she's a pretty one. Let me take that one. She can lose a little bit more weight. Uh, I, I jump over here. Uh, that, there, there goes a young man. Oh, I'll take that one. Come on. He looks like he's on drugs. No, let's not. I, I'm going to, you, you will do a 20 week Bible study for a doctor praise the Lord but let that drug dealer come in let that uh, prostitute come in uh, you only got five minutes uh, why because you're after a status uh, do you want a Jesus name status uh, or do you want a worldly status uh, God's not looking for a church Listen, you better, you better repent before the Lord destroys that graven image uh, that you're trying to build. Uh, you got to understand uh, that God's not concerned about you building your personal ministry. I don't know who I'm talking to. Praise the Lord. Maybe your own line. Uh, God's not concerned uh, about you trying to build your own personal ministry. Uh, God's not going to listen. Uh, that personal ministry uh, will become your own personal kingdom. Uh, that personal ministry of yours uh, is your personal graven image. Uh, and just like the Lord smote Dagon uh, and divided him asunder, uh, the Lord will smite your image. Uh, the Lord will smite your ministry. Uh, praise the Lord. Because God said here O Israel the Lord your God is one and have no other God before me what are you saying brother Hurt can I tell you praise the Lord the Bible said not many noble are called praise the Lord not many great people are called he said I went and he invited people to come to the party praise the Lord and there were people that said I'm too busy I'm going to build this house and another one said I've got to bury this person another one said I got a job I got to attend to another one said I've got a life and the Lord said well go out to the highways and to the hedges and compel all men to come in uh, that my house will be full listen I'm not saying you can't save the noble I just said you're not going to fill the house with the noble but whosoever will uh, let them come uh, quit passing over the whosoever will uh, they're trying to find a thousand nobles uh, and don't want them uh, quit passing over the hungry and try to feed somebody that don't want it You say you want revival. You want revival. You want the revival that makes you look good. You want the revival that makes your personal ministry look good. You want the revival that makes you saying I'm a member of Antioch Church look good. But I'm talking about the kind of revival that, 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 that nobody wants. I'm talking about the kind of revival where you have to say, you know, there, there's some people that can't have revival. You know why? Because when the young people come in, they say, you know what, what, what can, we, can we find a way, you know, because I got my children that are raised in holiness and, and, and I got these other children that are coming in and, and, and they sharing ideas with my children. Praise the Lord. And I don't want these new children to corrupt my children. So I'm going to go to a new church. I'm going to go to a new city. I'm going to go to a church down the street because I don't want these new people 
Bible influence it. My babies, listen, uh, if you ain't got enough Holy Ghost in your house uh, to determine that there's going to be a difference uh, between light and darkness, uh, Would you be acting that way if the little lawyer's child came in? Would you be acting that way if the doctor's child came in? Would you be acting that way, praise the Lord, if the judge's child came in? But let somebody come in that has a broken home. Let somebody come in that has a broken family. Let somebody come in that comes out of brokenness and bitterness and confusion in your life. Now you want to say you want to segregate. What do you mean you say, Brother Hurt, I'm not a racist? Uh, listen, you might not be a racist, uh, but are you a segregated saint? Uh, are you one that says, uh, oh, you can't go over their house? Uh, uh, do you understand? Uh, how is it that these children uh, are ever going to learn how to serve the Lord uh, when you segregate your children uh, for the new babies that are coming in? Uh, if they're supposed to come out from among the world and be separate, uh, if you're telling them to leave uh, their friends at school, and tell them not to have any fellowship with them but you withdraw your children from fellowshipping with them you are a liar you are a hypocrite you are an enemy of the cause you are a devil Now, you wonder why your children don't want to have anything to do with God. You didn't want to have nothing to do with the harvest. You trained them up in the way they should go. That's why they're chasing pulpits instead of chasing souls. Uh, that's why they think basketball is more important uh, than a relationship with God. Uh, why? Because you rather them play basketball than to win that new person. Uh, you rather them be the soccer player on the soccer team uh, than for them to win that new person. Uh, but is there somebody in this house tonight uh, that's going to wake up and repent? Now, I'm not just talking about wake up and saying man you're right I'm talking about waking up and repenting and say Lord uh, I repent uh, for how I you're, you are the reason why your children don't serve the Lord because when they had the opportunity you would true them because you were more concerned about your pretty little image You were concerned about the image of God. Revival is not pretty. Revival is not comfortable. Revival, there is no comfort zone in revival. The only comfort you will find is in the Holy Ghost. Revival there's no, there's no comfort zone there. What do you mean? There's always adjustments need, that are needed to be made in revival. Whenever you figure like you've got something figured out, something always is getting ready to change. There is no room for apathy in revival. There's no room for apostasy in revival. Revival will cost you everything. Not paying a staff as a replacement for your everything. What do you mean? 
what you're doing here is because you've got a great staff. Not because you're functioning like a great body. What are you saying, Brother Hurt? I'm saying tonight that the harvest is plentiful. You sitting up here talking about, oh, the world's getting dark. Don't nobody want it. No, it ain't, they don't want it. Maybe it's because you don't want it. Maybe it's going to be people that will follow the Antichrist uh, because the church walked around uh, like Jesus didn't want them. Why? Because you wouldn't go to them. Say, well, I belong to a church, praise the Lord. They've got a great outreach ministry, and uh, we got great pastors, and we got great preachers. And we have pastors, a visionary, and my bishop is a visionary. And yes, uh, we thank God for that. Uh, but they're not a replacement, my friend, uh, for your responsibility to walk in the vision. Uh, he said, without a vision, uh, people perish. Uh, if you don't walk in the vision, uh, you will die as one that had no vision. Uh, you got to understand. The word of the Lord is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. If you won't walk with them, that's not a replacement. Listen, you walking with people that walk with him is not a replacement for you walking with him. You have to obey him. You got to do what he tells you to do. You got to give yourself. Your family has to know something about dying out the self. Your mother hurt. I'm not, you know, brother hurt. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a extrovert. Intro, extrovert? Is it extrovert? Extrovert. There you go. I'm not an extrovert. I'm introvert. Uh, and I heard that that's just, you know, that's not my, my that's not my gifting. Uh, that's not my love language. You know, folks have gotten real philosophical. You identify yourself with everybody else's books. sick of people talking about you an introvert. Uh, what does the Bible say? Uh, greater is he that is in you uh, than he that is in the world. Uh, listen, uh, when the Lord gave Adam a word, uh, he didn't give him another book. Uh, he did not give him another thought. Uh, he did not give him another identity. He didn't say, hey, read these. These will be something good that you can read. Get in that Bible and say what God says about you. Think what God thinks about you. Walk in what God is telling you to walk in. Quit identifying yourself with anything that's not biblical. If you had any identity that is not written, you need deliverance. Anything uh, that will keep you uh, from reaching a loss uh, is a devil. Uh, anything that will keep you uh, from going out uh, to compel all men to come in, uh, it's of the flesh. Uh, it is a work of the flesh. Uh, it is not of God. Uh, it is not of the Spirit of God. Uh, he said, I command you to compel all men to come in. Don't you think because you were born where there was fire that you don't have a responsibility to keep it going? You got a responsibility for this thing. Uh, you got to quit saying, well, uh, I, 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 I need training. You know, today, folks said, I, I do. I, I just need training for this. Uh, I need training for that. I need it to work uh, around my schedule. Uh, the Lord spoke to me on the way to church. Uh, he said, George, I'm sick and tired uh, of the people doing Christ as a hobby. They're doing the kingdom of God. Uh, it's something that they do in their spare time. Uh, is this just a hobby or is this your lifestyle? Is the kingdom kingdom a hobby or something that you have been called to can I tell you that God did not call 
you to do this in your spare time. God did not call you to do this as a hobby. But the Lord said, come out from among them and be separate. You got to come out or you won't enter in. Soto la bacassa taba. Ila la mando co soto la bassata. Ila la bassoto. Oh, yeah, yeah, bassica. Oh, Moko bassata. A walk with God is not meant for spare time. What do you do in your spare time? Well, I go to church in my spare time. What do you do in your spare time? I I win souls in my spare time. What do you do with your spare time? Oh, God's called me to preach. I preach in my spare time. What do you do in your spare time? I, I, Jesus is my hobby. You are deceived. Uh, you got to understand uh, that God did not give you eternity for all, for just a spare time. Uh, listen, uh, you got to understand uh, the Bible says uh, uh, to everything there's a season uh, and a time for every purpose under the heaven. Uh, your purpose is not fulfilled in your spare time. Uh, your purpose is fulfilled all the time. Uh, it's going to require all the time. Uh, listen, God doesn't just want a spare moment uh, of your life. Uh, he doesn't just want a random day of the week uh, of your life. But he said, uh, if any man come after me, uh, let him deny himself uh, and take up his cross uh, and follow after me. Oh yeah, 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 my son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every man's work shall be tried by fire. You think, well, I, I want to, my, 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 my kid's education is so important. Your children's education is going to burn up one day. I'm not minimizing education. Yeah, I am. If you maximize it above the will of God. My, 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 my vacation is more important. My preacher, you got to have a balance. I was bitter at God because my parents made me do everything centered around God. I never do that to my children. Listen. It's not Isaac's fault that Esau was hungry for the wrong thing. You just got an Esau spirit. You're willing to sell the things of the spirit to gain the things of the flesh. And Jacob is willing to sell the things of the flesh to gain the things of the spirit, even if he's got to steal to get it. You've got an issue with value. You don't value the eternal things. You don't value the things of God. And the Bible said that God hated Esau, but he loved that thief, lion, Jacob. Don't be deceived by your goody two-shoes. You know, 
that thief will replace you if you're not hungry for what God has given you. There are things I want. What about what about me? What about what I like? What about you dying? What about you dying? What about you leaving this world? What about dying out to yourself? You want to make room for something. Make room for sacrifice. Start understanding the purpose for your breath in your body right now. Are you going to use it to gain the things that will soon perish? Or are you going to use it to gain the things that are eternal? Don't tell me you love God. And you don't deny yourself. Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Listen. You're not a bit more walking with God than the people that were with him for the fishes and the loaves. If when teaching comes, you rather scatter than die. Either you're going to walk out of here and do what you're going to do. Or you're going to die to yourself. You're going to deny yourself. Brother Hurt. I want to I want to be safe. I've got responsibilities. You have a responsibility to deny yourself. And I am concerned that many of you have put your call on the back burner so that you could give your children what you didn't have in exchange for what they could have had. You'd rather give them what you didn't have than give them what they could have had. 
but her. I want to be able to provide nice things. I want my children to see eternal things. If I don't give my son anything in this world, if I don't get to buy him his first car, he doesn't get to live in the most luxurious house in the neighborhood. If he doesn't get to go to the most prestigious college in the country. If he says when I die, all my dad did was talk about Jesus. If I got a long conversation out of him, he couldn't go too long without talking about Jesus. When I wanted my dad to be like some of the other dads, he kept giving me Jesus. Why? Because listen, I don't want my child to not know what to do when I die. But I need him to say, you know what? When my father takes his last breath, I'm not going to mourn and say, my father was all that I had. I'm not going to say that my father supplied all my needs. But my father directed me to my heavenly father. My father never stood in the way of my relationship with God. You are trying to do for your children what God is supposed to do for them. I'm not saying neglect. I'm saying deny. Yourself. Deny yourself. Some of them are going to want it. Some of them are not. But I'd rather it be said that I gave them everything I could have given them. And they just didn't want it. Than to say that I gave them everything they could have ever wanted. And they don't have Jesus. If you make what you do everything in their life, if you make what you do everything, what I mean by that, everything you do is to cater to what they want then Jesus is nothing in their life. And don't be surprised when they get older. All they want is you, and they don't want Jesus. Lift your hands. Paul said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto me. If 
if I have any regrets. Put your hands down. If I have any regrets. At times I feel like I played it too safe. I played it too safe. Can I be honest with you? I can't honestly sit here and tell you. And this is not being critical. But I can't honestly sit back here and tell you and give an assessment and say that I feel like the majority of the church Not just Antioch, but the church in this country. I can't honestly say that we're like Paul where he says, I count not my life dear unto me. Apostle Paul, he said, I. The decision that I'm making, it is not to save myself. But no. We, 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 we don't, we don't, our, our lives are dear to us. You know why? Because we have people that are dear to us. And I know right now I'm getting ready to walk on some very, very thin ice. You say, well, I, my, my life is dear to me, but, but, but my, my family, my children, my church, my city, my, my ministry, the people, my extended family, my friends, all these people are dear unto me. So therefore, the dearness that you have has made you make decisions or you use it as a, as, as, as a reason to count your life dear. That when God tells you to do something, if you feel that your decision is going to be at the disadvantage for temporary things for your family, you will reject the command and do what is dear to you. Listen. Peter had a family. Peter had a wife. And nine times out of ten, Peter had children. Jesus speaks to Peter and tells Peter, Peter, one of these days, you're going to die. It doesn't sound like a savior. It says, I want to give you a bigger house. I don't know, but that doesn't sound like the same Jesus that, 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 that says that I'm going to prove all your haters wrong. That don't sound like the same Jesus that says I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you everything you want. Doesn't sound like the same Jesus that says that 2020 delivered you hell, but after this, you ain't going to have to go through no more hell, no more pain, no more. You made it. We shout over things that are not God and weep over things that are God. The Lord speaks to the rich man 
And he tells her to leave everything. And the rich man became grieved in his spirit. Church. Paul said, I count not my life dear. Peter, one day, had to make a decision. Listen, his children were going to live without a dad. His children were going to live. Their children, the grandparents would never see. Grandpa, well, I, I got to be here for my children. I got to be here for my grandbabies. I got to be here for my great-grandbabies. When you try to be for your grandchildren and for your children what only God is supposed to be, you're robbing them of Jesus when you're trying to be all things for them. You've got to learn how to put it into perspective and say, you need Jesus. Listen, I know some of you are not liking it. But you're living like you've got tomorrow. The Bible says, think not on the things of tomorrow, but let tomorrow think for itself. We're not supposed to be ignorant of the times. And some of us in this room right now, I can feel the resistance. Because you, want, you thought that God was going to give you more time for you. You made it all about your, your, your home. You made it all about your family. You made it all about flesh and blood, even at the expense of people's souls dying. What are you going to do when God tells you to take you and your family, be missionaries in South America? That's, that's why you don't want to obey God. Because instead of God requiring a, a blessing upon your life, he requires a sacrifice. You, you have no problem with God as long as blessings are coming to the home. At the moment, he wants a sacrifice to come out of the home. Now you got a problem. I'm telling you, you're not walking with him if you don't deny yourself. They'll make just your kids. They'll are his. That's not just his, your family. Those souls belong to him. He has a purpose for your home. He has a purpose for your family. He has a purpose for your neighborhood. What do you say, Brother Her? We got to die. Are you saying? Paul said, I don't even count it dear to me. Some of us are willing to go against Scripture because of our love for people. I'm telling you, you got to listen. It's a dangerous time to have that spirit. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. He said, but I came to bring a sword to divide the father for the son, the mother from the daughter. That division is not just happening just within the world. That sword will go right through your family. Yeah, 
And if you value them, if you will deny everything for them, your denial is not for them. Your denial is for the Lord. Your faithfulness is not to them. Your faithfulness is unto the Lord. The plumb line of your family is not the needs that need to be met, but the plumb line of your family is your relationship with God. He says, He says, Didn't come to bring peace. You better make sure that your faithfulness is in proper alignment. Your love is in proper alignment. And it must be biblical. And don't be, because I feel, I feel it. You say, well, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, you, 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 you put all that stuff first. And, and, and you know, we, we, we didn't have nothing when we were kids because dad was just giving all the money to the church. And we didn't get to do this and that because all of our energy was, listen, I'm not saying that you don't be a father. Come on. Come on. But don't get it twisted. You're not the heavenly father. Don't get it twisted. You're the earthly father. You're not the heavenly father. Your relationship has an expiration date attached to it. Your relationship with them is temporary. If you act like your relationship with them is eternal, you try to do the job of an eternal father. When you die, they will be grieving your death as if there is no other father that exists. He said, when your mother and your father forsake you, he said, the Lord will take you up. But when you have not raised them and directed them and, and led them in the direction of the Lord, when you die, they die. It is better for you to die when God requires your life, even if you leave here early, then to stay here and try to do for what you feel like needs to be done in your family. So what do you mean? I'm saying if, if that's the case, I think you would quit wasting your time and you'd start redeeming your time and maybe love a little stronger. Love a little bit stronger. Love a little greater. Why? Any man follow after me. Let him first deny himself. Paul said, I count not my life dear to me. I'll let it go. I have a question. Are you holding on or are you letting go? Are all your decisions a letting go? See, a person says, I count not my life dear to me. They're not even thinking of self. They're not, when they, when they obey God, they don't first say, all right, how's this going to benefit me? When they make decisions, they don't, our, our house is going to be at my disadvantage. They don't sit back and critique the direction that God is trying to tell them to make. He said if a person puts their hand to the plow and looks back, you're not even fit for the kingdom. You might be fit for Antioch Church, but you're not fit for the kingdom. What I mean by that, Brother Hurt, you might be fit to play on the instruments. You might be fit to be a door greeter. You might be fit for the incorporated operation of the church. Don't get it twisted. When the rapture takes place, you could have this building. You might have been fit for the operation, but you weren't fit for the kingdom. See, we're going to 
Pastor, you know, I, I, I got stuff I got to do. And you, you always, you know, I need you to be telling, I need you to, to, to try to make it where, you know, if, if you're going to come up with something, you need to make sure that, 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 that you give me ample notice. You know, I got a life too. You ain't the only one with, with five kids and a wife. I, I got a life. And I need you to give me at least a month or two in advance if you want us to be here. Well, you want a hireling? Okay, I'm going to tap dance for you. You want a hireling? You want a hireling? Go home and sit down in front of your TV or in front of your YouTube and watch them on the internet. I promise you they'll send you a letter once a week. When that offering keeps coming in, they'll be watching for your offering instead of watching for your soul. Amen. See, if my pastor has to give me everything like, you know, saints, to, when you do that, then it's like this. Oh, God. Lord's talking to him. The Lord's like, David. Yes, Lord. This week, I want you to call a prayer meeting. I don't want to tell you what's going on. No, David, this week, I want you to call a prayer meeting. Yes, Lord. Is something going on? Lord, what's, what's, what's going to be happening? Lord, can I tell the people something? Is it, is it, is it, is it the dream that you get? David, this week, I want you to call a prayer meeting for the people. Saints, I heard from the Lord. I don't know why, but for some reason, I feel led to call a prayer meeting. They always do it impromptu. Well, you, you think he's just like pulling stuff out the hat? Oh, I'm just, I'm just going to call a prayer meeting today. Of the, come on. You, re, you, you think that's what he's doing? He ain't pulling rabbits out the hat. He's getting direction from God. And if you were wise, And you really trust that God has given you a shepherd after his heart. Well, you know, honey, I, you know, I don't understand why the pastor doing it, but you know, he don't run this up in here. So uh, we gonna do what we gonna do. I don't see nothing happening. And God talked to me. We got the gift of prophecy and word of knowledge. We got all the gifts of the Spirit. Church. If you're going to make the rapture, it's going to come through inconvenience. You have to serve God in the areas and respond when it is not convenient. That's why the Bible says, don't say, I'll do this tomorrow. I'll do that. You say, you're boasting. See, the thing is, you've been living so long that you think you've got ownership of life. You think life got to run through you before anything lives. You think, you, you think your ambition gives life to tomorrow. 
God will take you out of here and leave your children here. God will take you out of here and leave your parents here. God will take you out of here and leave your spouse here. So what do you mean? If God comes and gets you when he gets ready, then, honey, you better quit moving whenever you get ready. You better quit obeying God when you get ready. I, I just ain't ready. I'm just not ready to make that commitment. Like God just said, okay, I'll just come on back next week. Come on, church. I'm telling you tonight that God is telling us that we need to deny ourselves. When we do that, you know what he's got for you. He's got a big old cross. He's going to place it around your back. And he's going to tell you to walk. And you're going to walk the way that he tells you to walk. You're going to do what he tells you to do. You're going to live the way he tells you to live. Would you lift your hands? It's time for this church to function like a body. Miko Sotoba. Not just off the backs of a faithful few. You have a responsibility. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that's it. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Talk to the Lord. Lord, whatever you desire. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done tonight, Jesus. Come on, that's it in the name of Jesus. Whatever you've got to sacrifice. Come on. Come on, in the name of Jesus. I've got to make room. Come on, if you got to downsize, you got to teach your family what sacrifice is. If there's anything this generation is lacking, is we don't want to pay a price. Come on, but we've got, we, there's a price that we've got to pay. Revival is not a replacement for relationship. Come on, we've got to get that final destination in view. Come on, that's it in the name of Jesus tonight.
it's going to cost you everything. extended I want you to hold hands you and your wife do not let the enemy ever make you resent obeying God never let the enemy cause you to grieve or feel vexed because your obedience to God appears to have taken away natural things instead of added. The Lord says because your heart has hungered for greater treasure he says I'm going to give you and your family greater things. it's not without price it's not without cost the Lord says I will give you the desires of your heart according to my will never look for the way that is easy look for the way that is right accept the measure or the cup that God gives you the drink because the greatest thing you could ever have is not the things that are natural, but the things that are supernatural. That is eternal life. You could easily go and do what you want to save your life, but you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll find it. There are some things that you will find that you thought you lost, but you will find them as you begin to lose your life so that Christ can live in you. As you train your family to embrace these biblical values and principles, God is going to cause things to come unto you that could have came your way, but because you chose it his way, what you could have worked for, he's going to freely give and add to you. Just stretch your hands towards them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord for your plan despise not the day of small things in the name of Jesus Lord help my brother the rest in the mind of God and the peace of God help my brother to get rest don't look at the outward and feel like you're failing know that if you follow the voice of God and you follow the will of God things are going to come together Lord this night I pray that you would deliver him from his thoughts and help him to have relationship with you in this hour I thank you, Lord, that you're going to open up doors that no man can shut. I thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough. I thank you, Lord, for the healing. I thank you, Lord, for the gifting that you've put in them. In the name of Jesus, Lord, you declare that a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great people. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that your will, perfect will, be done. In 
Jesus' name. I was sitting on the couch one day and I was telling the couple or I said, I know that you guys have multiple children. And I said, and you're frustrated because it seems like other people are able to do more things than what you're able to do. I said, but even though you're not able to give them these natural things that you want to give them, you're giving them value. You're giving them spiritual things. You're giving them mom. You're giving them dad. I remember hearing years ago a woman say that I wish that she said, I'm, I'm not, she said, it's not the child support that I'm wanting for the man. She said, what I want is I want him to just have a relationship. There are people that are willing to pay child support, but they're not willing to give relationship. And I've heard it where single mothers have said that they could have made it without the child support. But the child had a hard time making it without the relationship. Sometimes we put more emphasis on this than we do on this. I remember telling this couple, I said, I see, I was like, I know you don't have all of what you want. You don't have the furniture that you want. You don't have the house that you want. I know you're tired of eating ramen noodles. <laughs> you know, you ever been broke? That's the go-to. That's still my go-to still sometimes. Like, yeah. That's still my go-to. Hallelujah. I said, I know you might not like it. I said, but nevertheless, I said, I said, look at how happy your children are. I know Kiz has got every game station it is. And they bitter. They ain't happy with nothing. I'm like, man, your children are excited with just playing with each other. You get the other kid, they get, you know, somebody, I guess they came out with a PlayStation 5. I guess it's going to probably be at least $500, maybe more. Folks, is how much? 500 that's ridiculous. I ain't getting it, and Isaac ain't getting it. If he get it, be because somebody else gave it to him. I might pawn it. <laughs> Take that thing to the pawn shop, brother. You can get this to seize with Christ. No. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. No, but $500 in the kid, you know. Like I told you, my son get an Xbox game. He got 2K19, 18, 17. And then he was like, oh, dad. You, they, they, I was like, what you want? I was like, for your birthday, I want 2K19. 19. I was like, dude, I just got you 18. Yeah, but the new one coming out. I'm like, like man, well, I played Matt 91 for years. <laughs> I played Joe Montana, man, for my God. It was 98. <laughs> I'm still playing. Double dribble. Double dribble. <laughs> Things get old. See, tangible things get old, natural things get old, but what you put in here, it never gets old. It actually gets newer and newer and newer. It revives. It increases over time. Church tonight, if you don't walk out of here with anything, love thinks not on the things of itself, but
but on the things of others. And if you will deny yourself, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You'll give yourself to people. You'll give yourself to God when you deny yourself completely. In Jesus' name, everybody stand to your feet. So we begin to worship the Lord tonight as a response. The Lord, I surrender. I deny myself, Lord. I lay it all aside. I lay aside all fear. I lay aside all doubt. I've got a destination in mind. One thing I like is I love to see, even in this service, there's some of your young children that are crying out to God. Some of them got their hands lifted, worshiping. No other joy than to know that your children walk with God. Come on, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to always be here, but if you can give them the love of God, not giving them what they want, but giving them love. Love is never a replacement can never be replaced. Come on, in the name of Jesus, I surrender all to you tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Maybe you got to cancel some plans. Maybe, maybe I was talking to Brother William believe it was he was telling me he said man I, I played basketball man God was God was working on me listen children don't just do that stuff something had to be put in them listen my friend that would have probably made some parent proud out there to be like man my, you see my son he, he, he out there doing this thing there go my baby I think that a mother has more joy. Which one has more joy? The mother that sees her baby over the stand and he come out there on the team like, you know. They got my baby. He got his shoes and all that stuff on your feet. Oh, woman. That son answered the call of God and became a missionary. But something happened. The child died younger than expected. His casket is sitting right there. But he died in the Lord. Which joy do you think is greater? The child that made it. And if, and, if, and if we can't take joy in that, we're selfish. And we're not really helping our children, but we're robbing them. What am I saying? Jesus needs to be priority in the home again. See, the thing is, I said something about like him becoming a missionary. We were like, yeah, you know, we started amen in that. But when it says something about dying. See, the thing is, we love Jesus until it's time to die. We don't mind following Jesus until it's time to die. And in this hour, I'm telling you, we will find our life if we will be willing to lose it. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's people going to miss some things. Why? Because you didn't even count it during the year to begin with. You notice that people that are always tripping stuff always happens to them. They're always offended. You're always offended because you're always tripping. Offensive things happen to tripping people. 
I love this man back here, boy. Yeah, don't nobody say amen. He going to say it. But nevertheless, you ever met somebody who just died out to themselves and they're like, but man, you know, they, they, done, they done cussed you out and everything. And they, you done cussed them out and everything. You go to them, I just want to apologize. I just had a bad day and I'm so sorry for, for cussing you out. No, oh, don't worry about that. Child, that didn't bother me a bit. I wasn't even thinking about that. And you're like, what? <laughs> she died out to herself. He died out to himself. When you don't count your life dear to you, your, your, your feelings, you don't count them dear. And right now in this hour, we got to cast aside the weights. Amen. Everybody worship the Lord in this house. In Jesus' name. Brother Isaac.